live. So those of you who are out there listening to me who didn't hear anything I said, it's too bad you missed my opening. But the question, <laughs> da 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 da, we're here at the game. No, the, <laughs> setting up your project. Welcome to your favorite game show. Okay. When, we, when I say we're going to set up a project, that obviously brings to mind things. But what kind of projects could we set up? And, and you started to say? Uh, uh, just a standard translation project. So in my language group, we have a language. We want to translate it. We're going to set up a project for that. And typically, that's going to be the New Testament, the Bible, a book, you know, portions, it could be one of those things, but we're going to have a, a standard translation project. So that's one, one type of project. Okay, what other kinds of projects could we have? An adaptation, An adaptation project. So I'm going to take something where I have a project already, and I'm going to adapt it, or adopt it, depending on where you're from. Of course, adopting a project sounds like they're going to be part of your family, and that sounds strange. So we'll adapt it. We're going to adapt a project into a related language or something, so, so it could be, and, and we call those typically a daughter project. I don't know why sons aren't allowed, but anyway, daughter project. Okay, what are the kind of projects might I have? Back translation. A back translation. What's a back translation, Ann? Back translation is an English rendition of the language project. Man, you just cut out half of the world, maybe more than that. It's, <laughs> it could be Spanish, it could be French, it could be in the language of wider communication, yeah. but in your... But in, but in your case, in your case, it's, an, it's, a, it's a translation back to a language of wider communication, generally so that the consultant can understand what the team has written. So, so we could have a project that's a back translation, okay? What other kinds of projects could we have? Notes, we could have a notes project. Okay. And we need to pick it back up again. Yes. Pick it up and, and revise it. Okay. Resume it. Resume it. Yeah. yeah. Start it up again. Get it going. Um, this is very real for him because that's what he's talking about wanting to do. So again, that's going to probably be a standard. It's going to be a, the project is going to be a standard type project. It's just it's a Bible project. We could also have a project, for instance, that's a transliteration, which is sort of an adaption. But the other day I showed you where Paratext could actually automatically transliterate it into a different orthography or a different script or something so I could do that. Oh, I'm working with a group in uh, Egypt who are doing an Arabic study Bible. Okay, one of the things that Paratext gives us is an ability to do a study Bible. Now in SIL world we typically don't do study Bibles but the UBS world they do lots of study Bibles where much of what much of, much of what the, the Bible societies tend to do is say, okay, we have a Spanish translation. Now, we're going to create a special study Bible that's got special, special study Bible notes. And, and you all have seen these in the bookstores. You know, this one's the military study Bible, and this one's the teen study Bible, and this one's the mom's study Bible, and this is the mom's who wear left-footed shoes study Bible, and this is the one for moms who have their hair up study Bible. You know what I mean? You know, so you've got all these different study Bibles. Well, where do those come from? Because someone creates a study Bible project that adds all those notes to it. And you can do that within the context of Paratext. Paratext allows us to have different types of things. Now, let's go to the question that I have up there. When you're setting up a new project, one of the questions is, okay, where is the text coming from that you're going to work with? Where is this text coming from? Is it something that already exists? Does, is it, you know, I mean, does somebody already write it down on paper somewhere? Or is it already in Word? Or it's something that you need to know. Are, are we starting completely from scratch? There's nothing? Is there some, you know, so th this makes somewhat of a difference in terms of, of what we're going to do. But I need to know, do I already have text? Is it already in a format that I can work with? Is the text Unicode? Does anybody know what Unicode is? Does everybody know what Unicode is? Does anybody know, not know what Unicode is? Do you know what I'm saying when I'm saying the word Unicode? <laughs> <laughs> Unicode. 
In, in our world of computers, in our world of computers, if we go back, back in the history of computers, we've gone through a variety of stages of encodings for text. And they used to be encoded in one of the earlier generations in a format we called ANSI, A-N-S-I, which gave you a font that had 126 characters, 128 characters. 128 characters. So your typical font, you could have 128 different characters. That's why sometimes you would open your, care, your project with a different font and it would look really funny because the, I would put my characters on this, this point. Sorry guys who are watching back there, you can't see me pointing, can you? So I would put my, I would put my thing on this point, see now they can see me. Um, I would put my code point here, and somebody else would put their code point there, and it'd be the same thing, so when you open the, the text, it'd look different. Unicode gives you millions of characters and allows us to, to agree that we're going to use a font that everybody can see things, and so all of our encodings typically now have moved to Unicode. Now, that's not something that typically underlying you need to know about, really. Except that if you've got old data, if, if you've got something that somebody said, I worked on this 10 years ago, here it is, it may need some help. So there's some of these things that we wouldn't expect the average user to necessarily say, oh, I can do all this by myself. You may have to call in a technician, may have to call in a, a Steve or a Neil to say, okay, can you help me get some of this ready to go? Okay, is it what's called plain text, if you open up a Word document, Word documents have data that is special encoded underneath. It's not quote unquote plain text. If you open something in Notepad, in Notepad it's plain text. Okay? So in order for us to work with paratext, we need a document that's plain text. And does it have basic markers? In, in, in our world of paratext, we mark our text with markers, and again, those of you who are on the live stream are going to see this backwards. We mark our text with things like backslash C and backslash P and backslash V to indicate certain elements of the text. A backslash C says this is a chapter. A backslash P says this is a paragraph. Okay. That also relates into how it gets formatted later, but this, this is something that happens with our text. So in order to, if I'm going to set up a project and I've got data, I've got text somewhere, then the question is, does my text have some of those markers? Because I can't really bring it into paratext unless I've got some of those things on it, ready to go. So again, a technician would help you, but if I just have a whole bunch of text, even if they're in paragraphs, and I just say, okay, just bring this in, paratext just takes it and lumps it all into a big pile. Okay, so I need to mark things, have it ready. Okay. So how do I create a new project? I create a new project under File, New Project, and there's some information that's required and so I'm going to open up Paratext, and I'm going to take us through this. Oh, look at that. I don't even have Paratext open anymore. I'm going to open up Paratext and take us through this. I don't want you to do this yet. I want you to watch with me, and then we'll, we'll do this together. You guys are going to actually create some projects. But first, I want you to watch me go through this process. So, I want to create a new project. I've got a bunch of stuff on my screen. For me, it's easier if I kind of just clean house a little bit. So I'm going to hit my blank and clear my windows so that I'm, I'm fresh. I want to create a new project. That's the goal. I want to create a new project. So I go to File, New Project. Don't do this, Dean. Take your hand off that mouse. You're going to get a chance. You're going to get a chance to do it in a minute. But if you're, not, if you're watching there, you're not going to see here. Okay, so when I, 
go to file new new project, there's some things that are different now in eight than in seven. The first is, is that up at the very top, there's messages given to me. In this case, it tells me that there are some incomplete tabs, and the incomplete tab is the general tab. When I open this window, I have four, five tabs across the top. General, books, associations, notes, and advanced. Four of those were there in seven. Books is new. Okay, so the other four were there. I have something here immediately visible that gives me help. What is it? Guide. Guide. Guide gives me help. So if I'm not sure about something, then I have a guide that will lead me through some of these steps. Number two says, has a red asterisk, a red exclamation point, or a white exclamation point on red. It has an indicator there that something's wrong. Okay. And if I hover over it, it tells me that I have to have a language suggested, selected. I cannot do this if I don't have a language selected. Okay. The type of project is got an exclamation. I have to have a type of project. Okay. Now, starting at the top, the first thing that's here is the full name. And I look at this and say, is that full name correct? Is that the name I want to call my project? Probably not. I would guarantee that most of you would never want to call your project my Paratex Project 5, except if you're doing a test. Okay. So normally, that has to be changed. If I try to click there, I'm clicking, I am clicking, nothing happens. Because there is an edit box to the right that actually controls that. So in order to change the name, I have to click edit. And now the same information that is found in these three boxes is here for me to edit. Okay. So I can choose a name, and for this test, I'm going to choose, this is my Paratext Workshop Test Project. If you notice that as I type the long name, the short name becomes made up of the initials. If the word is uppercase, the initial is uppercase. If the word is lowercase, the, word, the initial is lowercase. So that's how Paratext creates the default short name, okay, by filling that in. Now sometimes if you start putting in numbers or something, it reaches a limit where it says, okay, I've done eight characters. Eight characters is as much as I can have for the short name. So I'll put the 99 on, but I'm going to take off one of the other characters. Okay. So I have an eight character limit for the short name. And if I make changes, it's not going to change. So now I can, I can actually change this short name to be anything I want. So I could call it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Not a very useful short name for me, but I can make the short name anything I want. The first time I type, the long name, the full name, it's going to fill in the short name for me. But then I can make the short name whatever I want. I'm going to make it, this is my, okay. So I'm going to make it my, my name. The copyright, if I know who's going to hold the copyright on this project, I can put it in. Right now, I don't know that information, so I'm going to just leave it blank for the moment. But if I knew it, I would put it in. Okay. Notice that that then changes the information on the name. Now, when you're filling in a form, normally you fill it in from the top. That, that's normal. But this is one case where sometimes you actually want to start with the type of project, because actually the type of project is going to affect what the name was in one crucial place. If I choose the type of project as a consultant notes project, 
and I, well, never mind, I lied. Um, if you have not edited this, then when you choose consultant notes, it'll give it a name based on your name. If I've already chosen the name up here, then it stays there. So never mind what I was just going to say. So if I've set the name, the name is going to be fixed. When I click the type of project, notice how many types I've got. We talked about standard. We've got back translation, daughter translation, transliteration manual, transliteration encoding, study Bible, study Bible add-on, additions, auxiliary, consultant notes. Wow, I'm overwhelmed. I can't keep track of all that. Okay? Most of you are going to create standard projects or maybe back translations of those. Or maybe a daughter, which is an adaptation of one. Okay? While we're here, what is a consultant notes project? I have no idea. A consultant notes project is a special notes project that you, on your computer, can put notes in that only you see or anybody you share it with. It's not related to your standard project. It's not linked, it's not linked to any project. It's a, it's a project, it's a notes that look like regular notes. It's a notes thing that you can put your notes and comments in. So you as a consultant might want to have a consultant notes project that you just put notes in for yourself. The team doesn't see those unless you share it with them. Okay. Now, it's not, not linked to a project, but do you see the translation or anything? You, well, anything you have open on your screen, you can see. I mean, if you open a project on your, if you open a standard project on your computer, if you open a translation, you can see that. But the consultant notes are not linked to it. It's a separate project. And we're going to talk about notes. We're going to talk about notes later on in the week. But Lynn, what did you? Right, right. So, so if you choose a study Bible, a study Bible means that there are some special features that Paratext is going to add on that are only available if you're doing a study Bible, like ex what, what's called extended notes. There's an extended kind of notes, extended sidebar notes that allow you to put notes in a sidebar. Those things become available to you because you're using a study Bible. Since you're asking the question, I'll make it a consultant notes project. When I do consultant notes, it says consultant notes are not registered, but can use, send, and receive to the internet. So this is not a registered project. Notice I still have to choose the language. Okay. What language is my project going to be? And I'm going to say that it's in American English. Okay. Now, there's still other things that I could set up. But, but according to Paratext, there are no incomplete tabs. Notice at the top, the pink went away. So as, of, as far as Paratext is concerned right now, I could set up this project. Okay? So all I did was give it a name. I gave it a language. And in this case, I chose what kind of project was. And because of the interest here, I'm going to say it's consultant notes. Okay. So hang with me. I'm going to click OK. And it creates this thing which looks like notes. Those who've used, those who've used Paratext. This looks like notes. It doesn't look like a regular text project. There's no place to edit the text. Let me open my ZZ project. When I open my ZZ text project, I can say, I want a note on the word book. And I'm going to insert a consultant note. And it inserts it. This is a note. Notice that it didn't put any flag in my project. There's no, OK? It's not linked to that project directly. It's just a, it's a note. It's a note there. I could close ZZ test, and I could open up the NIV, and my note is still there on this notes project. The way notes do link is that if I'm here and I say view 
show consultant nodes, it will put a flag at the beginning of that paragraph to say there's a node. If I switch to the ZZ test, there's no flag because I didn't open consultant notes, but I can open that consultant note there and it puts the flag there because I've said open the notes. If I send this project, my ZZ test, to somebody else, they won't see that. This is only for me. Okay? But this consultant notes project that I created can be shared. So I could share it with Jim, and then when he opened it, he would see it. But he wouldn't see the flag in ZZ test unless he said show consultant notes. Consultant notes are a special type of project, special type of note, and we'll talk more about it later. I'm going to delete that project. Okay. And I'm going to go back to File, New Project. Okay. So when I'm in File, New Project, and here's what I wanted to say about type of project. Right now, the name is My Paratex Project. If I go to select this and say it's Consultant Notes, notice what happened to my name. Okay. So if I choose Consultant Notes, it will automatically name it, and it does it as my name, and then it creates that code. I can change that. I can edit that name and make it different, but it will do that. Okay. If I call it a standard project, once a name has been put up here, it doesn't change that again. It just I have to edit it. Okay. So I can edit the name. So let's work with a standard project. Okay. Again, I have to choose a language, and I will say that we are using um, Greek. This is going to be a, a text I'm going to do in Greek. And I'm going to give it a name, and I'm going to say this is my Greek, my big fat Greek project. translation. <laughs> Some people might want to call it my big fat Greek project, but I'm just going to, okay, so I'll call it my big fat Greek text translation. Okay, so, so I give it a name. I give it, now, when I'm naming it, this is where we've run into problems with our projects over the years because naming it my Greek translation isn't very accurate because then it becomes MGT and that could also be my Galatian translation or my Goliath translation or Mindy's um, general translation or, you know, my Goa text, I, you know, I mean, it could be anything. And so typically, as we're thinking about the name, we want to, one, think about the ethnolog code that is attached to this project, and, and particularly use that for the short name, or at least part of the short name. So what I'd want to do is look up in the ethnolog what's the what's the short name? I don't know how many of you are used to looking up things in the ethnolog, but, but if I right click and open up Chrome and search for ethnolog, and I look up ethnolog.com, then I could say, okay, I want to look for a language You can get a certain, I think, like one page or something for free, and, and then you, you know, so you can't do this a lot, but you get a certain number of checks on it. Um, but if you're in certain organizations, it's free. Not, well, yes, this is probably true. If you're logged in as that organization. So, so I look up Greek, and I see that the, the Greek code is ELL. That's the code for Greek. So if I'm going to do this correctly, then what I'd want to do is make my translation the ELL, at least ELL, and then I could add something like ELL Bible or something for the short name. For the long name, for the full name, I could still say it's my Greek translation. 
Okay, that's okay. But the key is that short name, I ought to include the ethnologue code in it so that I have something that very clearly delineates this from other texts, okay? Um, if I try to put certain characters in here, like I say, this is the ELL hyphen, okay? It doesn't like a hyphen. I can't put ELL hyphen, okay? But I could put ELL underbar, okay? So I could put ELL underbar New Testament, for instance, NT. So I want to make my name as clear and descriptive here as possible. If I try to use characters that are illegal, then it will warn me that I can't use those characters. What if there is no ethnologue code for the language? If there's no ethnologue code for the language, then you're going to have to try to look as close as possible. So if... So Okay, so what it was listed under that other language. That other language already had a full Bible. Right. So we didn't want to use that language code. But we used that language code and attached the first two letters of the country we were in, which was Uganda, because the language was basically based in, in uh, Rwanda. So we did it. It was a kin of project. Yeah, notice now, I did my first one, I did my first language, and then all of a sudden when I search first for the next, it's telling me I need to log in. Um, so I'm not going to log in. But, but yes, um, in that case, so that was the real in, in that case, I may have to do something. If, in some cases, like in Guatemala, many of the languages were combined. So where they used to have two codes for two different languages, now there's a single code. But the old codes are still available. So you may want to ask for some help specific on a particular language to see what we can find. But you may just have to use as close a dialect as possible and then use, a, use an extension on it and say ELL new or something. You can also petition Ethnologue. You could petition Ethnologue if there's a reason to petition it. So I want to make sure I want to do my best to make sure this name is as clear as possible. If this is a back translation then I want to probably mark it as a back translation and maybe put BT at the end of the short name, put back translation. Or if it's a daughter or an adaptation, I want to name it as clearly as possible so that I know what kind of translation this is, what, particularly if it's like a, a, a back translation. If I put a BT at the end of the name, then it's much easier for me to see my back translations. Okay, or put BD at the beginning of the name, back translation, ELL. Okay, I have to choose a language. Now, when I choose the language, what if my language wasn't here? What if, what if I'm looking for something else that's not here and it doesn't exist? This is where we get into an issue of language setting. And so I click on New, and it's... There's two things happening here. At the top, it's saying I need a language name, but at the bottom, it's searching. So what I want to do is I want to start searching. Um, so what's the language name, Mary? Oh, well. Give me a language name. Um, well, why don't you use I'll give C. Give Spell it. Y-A-N-S-I. Okay, so when I do Yansi, I see several things that come up. I see Yansi, I see Yans, I see East Yansi, I see West Yansi. Okay. So if, but they all use the same code of Y and S. Okay. So part of it is I have to try to know which one it is. Okay. Do you know which one it would be, East or West? So I'm going to just use Yansi. When I choose Yansi, down at the very bottom, notice that immediately at the top, it put the language name is Yansi, so it put that in for me. Down at the bottom, I've got some advanced options. Okay, is there a special script? Well, these scripts are special scripts used around the world in terms of things like Bengali or Cyrillic, scripts of different alphabet scripts. Okay, well, this doesn't probably have a special script. 
So that's not something we need to look at. Is this a part of a special region? Well, I could identify the region where it goes, but in this case, I could probably only identify it by country. So really, identifying the country is probably not as critical, but, but I could identify the region there. Then there's a variant, and there are certain variants that have already been identified for certain things, but this probably doesn't have a specific variant that's already been listed. But this is where you could write in a variant. So I could say, I could choose to manually type a variant. And you'll notice that down at the very bottom here, it's telling me what that name is going to be now based on the variant that I typed in. This would also, if I chose a script, and I'm just going to randomly cho choose something here. If I choose things, as I choose these, this information, basically it adds that advanced information to the, the name and fills it in. So if you have a language that you want to make more specific, then you can either choose some of the preset options or with the variant you can with the variant you can actually type in something okay with the other things you can't you can't type something individually but here with the variant I could so I could type in something specific that I wanted to add to that okay click okay now that language is there, but it didn't actually add that variant, did it? So I can verify this by going to Edit View, and I can see that it is actually there. It didn't add it to the language name, so I might want to change this and say language name Yancy and, and add whatever part I want to the name so that I have the name that I'm working with. So I can choose the name, and then we'll get to language settings. We'll talk about language settings in a minute. Okay. Versification of a text has to do with where the verses are, and for the most part, most of us use kind of the same versification. But in the Old Testament, sometimes when you're looking at Psalms, you'll see a Bible that says Psalm 22, parentheses 23. Okay? That's because there's two different versifications being considered. And so the versification for one says that this is chapter 22. The versification for the other says it's chapter 23. Which versification should I choose here? really depends kind of on how I'm working and probably what I'd want to do is see I'm following the NIV what versification did the NIV use and if you remember when we were looking at open projects before we could see the versifications in the list so I might want to look and say what versification are these source tools using right and so so yes, this is not something that we're doing in isolation, hopefully. Hopefully we're doing this together. But the reality is oftentimes one person sits down and starts doing this. And the question is, did you discuss this in the brief? And did you discuss in paratext what the options are? So again, you'd want to look at this. But one place to kind of see what the, the, the options would be is to look at resources that exist and see what versifications they were using. Generally, for things we're doing, we're, again, it just depends on your region. If you're in, in Central um, Asia, you might be using the Russian you know, as a, as a deception. You're probably going to use, for most of what we're doing, you're probably going to either use the original or the English as a starting point. We can customize, and you can change that later, yes, but we can customize this as well. Okay. Now, there's a based on column here. That based on column only becomes active 
if I'm doing a type of translation that requires a based on. So if I switch this to back translation, then it would say I need to base it on something. Back translations have to be linked to a front. If I choose daughter translation, the daughter translation has to be linked to the front. But something else happened when I switched from standard to back to daughter. On a standard translation, there's an option here to register online. On a back translation, it says back translate, base project is not selected, but the registration, the registration is inherited from the base. Okay? So for a back translation, I don't register it. If I switch to a daughter translation, a daughter translation is registered separate. If I switch to a transliterated, it gets its from the base. If I choose to a transliterated with encoding converters, which we did the other day, now I have to also choose what the encoding converter is, but the registration is gotten from the base. Okay, so as I choose the type of translation it is, the type of translation I choose is going to determine whether I have whether I can. I do not have to. Okay, hear that. I do not have to register, but I can. Why would I want to register? Send receive to the internet, printing interlinear. Okay, so if I don't register it, I can't send receive to the internet. Again, I, I'm going to keep kind of cycling back on that thing because that's, that's what happens. But I don't have to. For this test process, in a minute, when we start doing this, I don't want you to register them. Okay? For the moment, I don't want you to register. We'll register projects later, but I don't want you to register these. Okay? So the kind of project that I create is dependent on that. Now, an auxiliary project is a special type of project that basically the idea there is, is that I'm creating kind of a duplicate of the project that I'm working in and I'm going to do stuff, but it gets the same users, the same everything, and I can't change that. Why would you do that? I haven't really figured out exactly why. I, it, there's, there's question as to whether this is useful or not, but some people, you might want to just have a different, a separate project of the same if text. You, I wouldn't use the auxiliary for that. I would probably use either a daughter translation or a, a trans, well, probably a daughter translation so that they were actually separately registered. And then I'd bring the text in and I'd modify it. But there's different ways to go about doing that. It depends on how, we want, how much change needs to be made. So, so on this first page, on this general page, there's some important things I need to keep in mind. One, I need to make sure the name is set right. Okay, I need to know that I've chosen the right type of project, and I need to, to choose the language, make sure the language is, is chosen. Okay. Notice now that I've chosen standard. Notice I still have pink up there. Okay. But now it said that there's a problem with the Books tab. Okay. So I go to the Books tab. On the Books tab, this is called the Project Scope. This is a new feature in Paratext 8. It did not exist before. And the idea here is that I'm going to pick what books are in this project for the project plan. Now, back translation won't have this because the back translation gets its scope from the front, from the front. Okay? So certain projects won't have this, but if it comes up and says you need to include the scope, then you'd want to come up here and you would say, are we talking about the Old Testament, the New Testament? If I choose all books, that includes the Deuterocanonicals. If I say, oh, I messed up, I can deselect 
and start over. Okay, I just am doing the New Testament. So I choose what books are in the scope of what we're doing. Can I add to the scope later? Sure. Okay, if later on, if I start and say we're doing the New Testament, and then later on we say, okay, let's do the Old Testament too, I can add the Old Testament. If I say we're doing the book of Luke, and later on we want to add more books, I can do that. Okay. Or I could take something off the scope if I said, oh, you know what, we're really not going to do, we, we decided not to do the whole, whole New Testament, we're just going to do the Gospels, then I could take the rest of them off. All that's changing is what's seen by the project plan. Okay, the project plan works with what's the scope. This does not change what books I have in paratext, per se. If I take, there was a time when if I took something out of here, it deleted it from paratext. And we decided that was a bad thing. It's, it's like, whoa, what happened? I, I, what happened to Genesis? I, you know, I, I didn't want it in the plan. I didn't mean to take it out of the project. Okay, so, so this just deter, determines what's in the plan. Now, there's three other tabs here. Let's take a quick look at these. I don't expect you to remember each of these things. What I want you to capture is there's some different places you have to go. Okay. How do you get there? You click on them, and when you click on them, what do you notice on the right-hand side? A guide. And the guide tells you what's going on here. Okay, there are two associations that are, are set here. One is the biblical terms list. What biblical terms list is being considered? And the associated lexical project. The associated lexical, pro uh, associated les lexical project has to do with field works, flex. Okay, so if you're using field works, you can associate a project that will allow you to look up related words, look at words in the dictionary, things like that. We're not, I'm not planning on taking a lot of time with that, but if we want to look at that later, we probably could. The biblical terms list determines what is the basic list that you start with when you open up biblical terms. And what they've put in here is the PLT project biblical terms list. Okay. When I open up, when I open up this choose, there's several choices that I can make. Major biblical terms, all biblical terms, the major SIL, the New Testament, the ELL New Testament. ELL is this project. That's the name of this project, right? So I could have this project's New Testament list, or I could choose a list from any other project that happens to be on this computer. So all these other projects that have been working, all of them could have lists, and I could duplicate their list. So if I've got a project that somebody shared with me, and they had a biblical terms list they used, I could use their list. Okay. We're going to talk about biblical terms later, so I'm not going to go into a lot more detail here. What I want you to capture is, this is where you can choose what the default list that's going to be opening when you open biblical terms. What's the default list? I'm going to, for the moment, I'm going to choose major biblical terms. Does, does that mean when you, when you choose that, you're just getting the, the base list? It's not like anything else that they just, you know. The renderings and things they've chosen, none of that comes. It's just the list of, it's, it's what terms, what terms did they decide were important? Okay. So I've associated that. If I have Fieldworks installed, then I could choose a Fieldworks database to associate. I'm not going to do that right now. Okay. Then I go to the Notes tab. On the Notes tab, and again, this is where, this is where quite honestly, it becomes very difficult to teach one thing without teaching everything else because we haven't really talked a lot about notes. Okay? We saw the consultant notes project that I just created and the consultant notes project will do this as well. But when you are in notes, by default you have one type of, of what's called tag, one type of icon that comes up and that's this red flag. But you could have a number of different flags that you're using. Now, one of the concerns that some consultants have said is, 
this project has five flags like this, and this project has five flags like that, and this project is using five flags like the other, and they're all different, and I don't have any idea in any way of keeping track of who's using what flags. So let me say this. If you are the consultant, you set the then you should set the flags, and you should work with your teams and say, you know what, guys? Let's all of us use this same set of flags. And then within the project, you could change it. But, but so this project, this project, this project, let's all use the same tags, OK? Let's all use the same, same tag set. To do a tag, I click on Add Tag. And it automatically adds a new icon. I can actually click and change. I can choose one of three colors. See, some, Katie's going, I never knew that existed. I can choose one of three colors. The two bottom ones are what are considered the inactive and the resolved. But so I could say, I want this pretty blue triangle. I can give it a name. Grammar. Grammar. OK, I can give it a name. I can say it's restricted. In other words, the only person who can resolve it is the person who created the note or the administrator. So I could re restrict it. And I could give it a template. If I give it a template, what happens is when I create a note and call it a grammar note, it'll immediately put that template on there. So it'll always start each note with that phrase. Okay. This is an exegesis or punctuation. punctuation. Is, this, is this punctuation correct? Okay. And if that's the template, then every time you apply that, it's just going to put that on there. You don't even have to write the note. The template will fill that in for you. Okay. So, so again, like many of the other places in Paratext, this is a place where, in reality, this can be really, really powerful if you take your time to set this up correctly and do it. But the concern is it should be somewhat consistent among the teams. There has been a call for Paratext to create a set of maybe 10 tags that everybody could use. Some people would like that. The problem is, OK, how do we decide which 10 and do they have templates and do you know are they restricted or not so let me say to you as a consultant consider if you're working with teams consider deciding how you want to set this up if you want to do that but you can add tags can you change later like halfway through you're tired of that this is a grammar note and you just want to say grammar note you could take the template out you could edit the template later but is it going to change it won't change the ones that are done Okay. It won't change the ones that are already done, but it would change from then on. Okay. And then the last tab is advanced. And this is, this is important. Typically, you're not going to change much here. Okay. But it's important to kind of know what's here. And I'll say this for, again, for people who are kind of listening in. The, the first thing is called the style sheet. Paratext uses a style sheet that says, a paragraph should be indented this far and should be this big font. And it should be this color, or it should be, the, you know, a section head should be centered on the page and it should be this. A, a script, a parallel passage should be italic. And so the style sheet says all that. By default, we encourage you to use the USFM style, usfm.sty as the basis. Because that's a style sheet that has all of the markers that we consider acceptable for publishing and such. It is possible to customize this, and we'll talk about customization of this. It's possible to customize this with a, what's called a custom style file that, as your basis, you use USFM. And then in your project, you customize and say, I want to add green to all my section heads, so my section heads stand out, for instance. Okay? So I can do customization, but we want to do that with a special additional file that we're going to put in the folder. The typical file name, you'll notice that it chose a format 
that format can be edited, but it can only be edited before you create it. Once you create this project, you can't go back and change it. Okay? But right now, I, I'm saying that the, there's a scheme which is 41 mat, mat. I could say, I don't want to have 41 mat, I just want to have it to be mat. So I want my files in Windows, it's what the name are in Windows, I want them to be called Matt, Mark, Luke, John, etc. The problem is that if you do that, then they don't alphabetize very well. Okay? Because Luke comes before Matt then. So if you use the scheme that we've set, 41 Matt, that means it's going to be 41 Matt, 42 Mark, 43 Luke, 44. So then they line up, they alphabetize. So that's the reason for that. Somebody asks, why are we starting Matthew at 41? Okay. Is, did I hear that question? Yes, I heard that question. Okay, because how many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. 39. So one would think that Matthew might start at 40, but they didn't do that because there are intercanonical books that they left at kind of 40, and so Matthew starts at 41. Part of the long history probably not going to change that, but that's where it is. Okay? But you can change the extension SFM is a standard nowadays. There used to be a time when we used PTX for the extension on Paratext files, but PTX is a hidden Windows extension, and so that can create problems if you do a Windows restore. It restores them back to the way they were um, last year, and you never want to restore your project back to the way it was last year, probably. So, so typically, typically, you're not going to change that. The encoding, as I told you, Unicode is our standard these days, and so typically you're going to choose Unicode. But there are projects that have data that's in other formats, and so you might choose a different encoding. Normalization. Some of you, yeah, OK, you guys are sort of seeing me. Some of you may have seen that sometimes you'll see a character that looks like that, an accent today. In Unicode, this has a particular code point, and it has one code point. But you can also take an A, which is one code point, and then add a combining character, which is another code point. So this and this are two different things. This is a compose, this is, this is composed because it's a single character. This is what's called decomposed because it's made up of multiple characters. And in Unicode, you, you want to have things normalized. You want to have everything function the same way. So you can choose whether it's normally composed or it's normally decomposed. Again, if you don't know the difference, don't worry about it. Just leave it, accept it as, the stand, as what's there, and just go. But for some language groups, they're going to say, OK, we want to choose which way this goes. It, it affects, it, it, it depends on what your keyboard. And this is one of the reasons this is a problem is that one person has a keyboard, and when they type, it puts it this way. And somebody else has a keyboard, and when they type, it makes it this way. And what happens is, or what used to happen, is in the word list, you'd have two different words that looked exactly the same, but they had different characters. Okay? Or if you did a search, it would find this one, but it wouldn't find this one, because it, it didn't recognize what you were typing. Well, now, Paratext will normalize that. So if you type this, even if you type this, Paratext will consider it the other, and so it works that way. That's what the composed means. This does impact if you're bringing a project over from Paratext 7, because you might see yours may say none, which may mean there's no normalization. That's where you need to make sure you're all keyboarding it the same way, okay, and work with it the same. If you're importing, yeah, if you're importing your text, you, you, you would probably want to check and make sure. But you'd want to look at your, 
again, this is good as we get into checking and things. You want to look at your character list and make sure that we've got everything right. If you're migrating, if you're migrating though, would you, you don't get a chance to look at that. You don't get, you don't get a chance to look at this before you do it. So you'd want to consider looking at your text before you bring it in and say, are all our characters the same? But again, you do that in your character inventory. Okay. okay. Is editing enabled? Um, if you turn that off, what it means is I can't edit this at all, which you probably don't want to create a new project and turn editing off. Okay. <laughs> probably not a good idea. Do you want to allow other Paratext users to act this, access this project as a resource? Right now, that option is not available to us. Do you want to share the language information with the SIL deposit repository? And there's a why here. Why would I want to do this? Okay. The way we have a, a language repository, a data repository, where we're trying to keep track of information about the different languages in the world. What are the, what are the characters that are used in that? What are the sort orders? Okay, and as we look at the language settings, we're setting up what are the characters in this language? What, what's the sort order? What's the orthography? How's that work? And so if you are doing this in Paratext, you can choose to share that information with the data repository. Now, I don't know that you'd want to share that unless you're sure that your data is actually the authoritative, accurate data. If you're sure your, your data is the authoritative, then yes, you'd want to share this. Okay. For our test, we're not going to do that, obviously. If you go through and you set up a new project, and then you want to go back and change something in it later, can you? Certain things can be changed later, depending on what we've done. So, so again, looking at this, I go through, I've checked each of these tabs, and I've made sure that everything's set. I'm not registering online right now. And I'm going to click OK. When I click OK, this is a standard translation. When I click OK, it's going to open up to this standard translation. It gives me the warning that it, it's not registered. So if I want full functionality that I need to register, it's always going to tell me that. I could close that window. And then it tells me that the books don't exist. Do I want to import the data in, or do I want to create new books? So this is where it goes back to that question of, did I have data somewhere else that I'm going to import? And the question is, is that data in Unicode? Is it plain text? And does it have the markers on it? I can import it from something. In our case, in our case, I'm going to, and, and when we do this exercise in a minute, we're going to import right from the ZZ99, ZZ test 99. So to import text, I simply go down to wherever the text is found. In this case, it's, it's here. And look, there are my SFM files. So I can choose the ones I want to import. Just select them all, like standard window selection, selecting with the shift. And it's going to, again, bring up this very similar window to when I did the, the restore and tell me that right now these books don't exist in the project, but I'm going to import them in, and I say OK, and it goes out and it imports the data. Now, I could do that because the data that I was importing was plain text. It was Unicode, and it had markers on it because I was bringing it actually from another project. I could have been bringing it from some folder on the memory stick. I could have been bringing it from lots of different places. In this case, I brought it from a, a different Paratext project. I just brought it in. To work with. So now I have a project. Ta da! Let's go back to this. Where do I change the settings on it? I change the settings on a project under Project Properties and Settings. That's the, the default. You'll notice that there are certain things that I can change and certain things that I can't. If I click Edit, you'll notice that I can no longer change the short name. The short name has been fixed. Okay, so once I hit OK, I can't change that. I can change the long name, okay, the full name, but I can't change the short name. Okay. I can change the language. Okay, I could choose a different language. I can change the versification. I can change even what type of translation it is. So I can say, oh, this really was a back translation. 
it was based on the ZZ test. Okay. Now again, notice that the, the registration goes away. When I click OK, it changes it to a back translation. What makes a back translation different from a standard translation? What do you notice has changed? It put in a bunch of boxes. Every verse now has a box associated with it where I can say, yes, this back translation is a good back translation. So I could simply click it and say, that's a good back translation. Or I could come up to the top up here and say, I want to mark all the verses in this book is finished, or all the book verses in this chapter is finished. So if I mark all the verses, now I've said, but this back translation is linked. We'll talk more about back translation later. But I can change this because I have not registered it. I can change it. So if I go back to project properties and settings, well, now I can't change it because I linked it, because I linked it to a project that was registered then it's fixed. So now, forever and ever, I'm in, it's a back translation. Okay. What if I said, oh, this is wrong. This isn't, this isn't a back translation. I really don't want this. What would I do? Delete the project and start over. Okay. I can delete just the back translation. I can delete this project and get rid of it. Okay. But before I do that, let's take a look. But you notice now that at this point, certain things have locked in. So like the, the versification and the type and the based on, all those have locked in. Under the, the advanced tab, the composed is locked in. If I click edit, I, I can't. Okay, I can't change the short name anymore. I can change what style it's based on. But as I say, I would recommend you keep it as the USFM style. Okay. You'll notice that there's a bunch of other ones that people have created. Okay. Notes, I can still add different tags. I could change those. The associations, I can still change the associations. The books, I can still change and add books. Okay. But certain things have locked down. So once you do that, certain things lock. The reason it locked is because it's picked up its registration now from the front the standard translation. If it wasn't registered, then some of those things like which type would still be available. The moment you register a project, it basically does the same thing. So if I had registered it as a standard translation, it would have locked in too. And then the question becomes, where do you change the registration of a project? and it's on the registration website. Okay. So you so we start once we register it, once we register it, then we have to start interacting with the website to get that done. So in this case, just so I understand better, this is it turned it into a back translation and if you were to go to projects, there would be no base project anymore because it would just be a back translation. Well, I had a project named ELLNT, and originally it was a standard translation. When I changed it to a back translation, then there is no ELLNT standard translation anymore. The, the only translation is a back translation, right? But it's associated, it's linked to this other front translation over here. Okay, and we'll talk more about how to what that link can be. Because I linked it in the settings. I linked it to the ZZ test project. So this, this back translation, a back translation is linked there. Now, some people create a back translation and they never, call, they never link it as a back translation. They just call it a back translation. It's a standard translation, but they call it a back translation. You can do that, but then you lose all the benefit of linking the translation together so that it knows what's happening. So, if you're going to do a back translation, typically you want to link it to 
the front. Okay? You want to link it to the front so that it, that it gets that information. Do you have more than one back like Yes, I think you can, Neil. You can link multiple back translations, right? So you could have one back translation in Spanish and one back translation in English linked to the same front. I mean, so I could do that. It wasn't an accident. I did it intentionally. Well, I know you did, but... <laughs> but if you did it accidentally... Okay, the back translation is based on the, the ZZ. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there is no new, trans, new translation project. So, do you do it again? Do you make another one? Well, okay, so, so here's, here's, the, here's sort of what I was trying to do. I said I want to go create a project. Okay. If I was wanting to create a new translation, you know, a new standard translation project, I'm going to create a translation project for Yancey, okay. then I want that to be a standard translation. Okay. If I make it a back translation, in order to make it a back translation, I have to say it's based on something else. Okay. So if I have a back translation and I say it's based on Yancey, then there has to have been a Yancey project that I'm linking it to. I can't just make it based on anything. I mean, so I have to base it. So it, partly it's a question of what is it you're trying to do. You've got to link the back translation to something. So I can't accidentally okay. create the back translation. Okay. I mean, I, I did it because I realized that what I wanted was a back translation based on the that ZZ test, so I did that, and when I did that, it, it automatically locked in some things because it's now registered under it. Okay. But if I really wanted to create an ELL New Testament that was a standard text, at this point, I would either need to create a new project completely and get a new name, or I'd have to say, this back translation, oh, they messed up, that, it's not supposed to be back translation, so again, I'm going to delete that project and I'm going to start over. And now's when you can put your hands on your, your mice. Okay, so I just deleted that project. Now's when you can put your hands on your mice. And what we want to do is we want to create a couple of projects. So, first of all, where do you go to create a project? File, new project. So if you go to File, New Project, it's going to open up a window that gives you the ability to choose some things. Now, there's two pro. I'm going to I'm going to bring up my my um, PowerPoint here again, so you can see what it is we want to do. Okay, here's the here's what you're going to do. So you're going to do a standard project that's called ZZ Test 17, and I've I've put some settings there so you know what settings to choose. And then you're going to create a daughter project called ZZ Test DP, and I put some settings there. Okay. So I've got some settings up there, but remember you want to make sure you check the other tabs, you know, to see what's there as well. So, so ZZ Test 17 is the short name? The what? The short name, yes, those are the short names, but it, you could use it as the long name as well if you want. You could use it as the, long, the full name and the short name, but it's got to be at least the short name. Okay? That's got to be the short name. So the short name needs to be ZZ Test 17. Okay, so to edit that, click on edit. Okay, and so for the short name, well, go, just wipe that out, wipe that out. All the way, just delete it all. And put, put Z, it's going to be long and short. 
put ZZ test 17. Seventeen. Okay, now copy that and paste it down here too. We're going to use the same name for the long name and the short name. Oh, yeah. Yes, you want the same name for the long name and the short name, or or at least you want the short name to be ZZ Test Seventeen. You can make the long name something else if you want. The long name can be anything you want because that can change. But we want the short name. We want the short name to be ZZ Test 17. So just copy that. Just highlight it. No, no, no. Don't delete it. Okay, delete the CC, yeah. Okay. Use your mouse, drag over it. Yep. No, no. Here. So what we want to do is click the left mouse, we're going to click and just drag over it, okay? See how I dragged over it? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to right click and copy. Come down here, right click, paste. So now we have the same thing both places. Okay, click OK. Okay, so the language should be English, so for the language click on this drop down, click on there, and choose English. Okay, the versification is going to be English, it's already English, that's good. The type of project says create a standard project, for so type of project we want to choose standard. Standard. Okay, we're not registering these please. Okay, then it says other settings, check all tabs. So you need to go to books. I didn't tell you how many books to do. I would do at least the New Testament. So click New Testament. Okay, so that gives you books. Okay, click the association. Okay, we're going to accept the default, but it's major biblical terms. We're going to accept that. Okay, go to notes. We're going to accept the defaults. That's the notes that you've got. We're going to accept that. Click advanced. And we're going to accept that. Okay, and so once you've checked all the tabs, then E is click OK. I've seen this before. I've seen this done before. Okay, now the next step is import, import the book of Matthew. So right here it says create books or import books. So you want to import. So click, Im click on the import. Just click out here somewhere. Yep. Import. Click up here. Click import books. Okay. Now we want to go to the go to C drive. Here. Yeah, double click. Go to my Paratext 8 projects. Um, double click here on the icon. On the icon. Okay, go down to ZZ test. Go go down to ZZ test 99. Just keep going down. Gotta go down further. Okay, ZZ Test 99. And Matthew, so double click on Matthew. Okay, so now you're importing Matthew. Okay, click OK. And there, you're done with that first task. Okay, now the second one is to create a daughter project. Okay, click on a daughter project, and so you're going to create a new, now you're going to create another new project, so where do you go to create a project? Right? New project, up at the very top. Okay. This time... It's going to be a daughter project, so the type of project is going to be daughter, so let's change this to daughter. You want daughter? Okay. Now you need to say based on, and it's going to be based on the ZZ test. 
here. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go down to the ZZ test project. So go down. ZZ test 17. Okay. Now we need to give it a name. So go up to the edit the name. And this time it's going to be called ZZ Test DP. So you're going to edit the name just like you did with the other one. Right in here. Matthew's the only book. We want it to be ZZ Test DP. Did you get her working again? You got yours, Larry? Yeah, except I have a have notes. Did you associate something? Yeah. What DP D okay, so D P. D P. Now, so down here we want to make this, change that to Z Z test D P. Z Z test D P. Get rid of all that. Yeah, okay. ZZ test DP. Okay. Click OK. Okay. What language is it? You can, again, choose English. You would choose your language. Choose English. Okay, now the versification is English, everything else. So now you need to check your other tabs. Check your other tabs up here. Check these tabs. You know, as soon as I put stuff in, that register thing goes across. Right. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's just look, what it's doing is it's going out to see does this project have a registration. Or so click on books. Okay. You need to add books. So what books? Let's again do the New Testament. Okay. Click o go to the associations. And we're going to accept the defaults. And go to notes. Go to notes. And we're going to choose. We're going to accept the defaults and go to advanced. And we're going to accept the, the defaults. Now you can click OK. And now it, now it has done that. Now we want to create a book. So instead of importing, now we're going to create a book. So we're going to create, click on Create Books. And we're going to choose Matthew. So we're going to choose the book of Matthew based on ZZ Test 17. So you're going to click on the light the link down here to ZZ test click on create based on okay and we're basing it on ZZ test 17 so that's what we want to do click OK and you're set you're good okay do you guys have yours okay 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 Okay. How are we doing, Lynn? Okay, let's see. Okay, did you delete them or you closed them? I, I, I think I just, maybe I just go to open. Them. Go to open project resource. Okay, do you have ZZ test 17? Yes, but you don't have ZZ test. There's ZZ test 17, so you want ZZ test 17. So you've got that one, but you don't have ZZ test DB, so you need to cr open that up. Okay. So you've got that one, but you didn't. You I, I did something that I deleted like that. Um, you deleted all your data. Yeah, I, I'm kind of lost now as to where I'm. I okay, go go to project, delete entire project. Go to project and delete the entire project, and start it over. Just delete it. Okay. Just press OK here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now, go go back. Go back and do it again. File, create.
create new book and Okay, so we're good? We're good, Jim, good? Dean? Almost there? Almost good. Okay. Chetty, you're good? Okay. What okay, but now what are you trying to do now? Start all over again. Okay, so what so what are you trying to do? Okay, so you don't want to open a standard project, you want to go to file new project. First thing, new project. Okay, so give it a name, and you want you want the name to be ZZ Test 17. Hey Neil, or Steve, can you kind of help Lynn here? All right. So. We're almost all there. We're, we're finishing up. What I want you to, hopefully what you've captured, is that it's relatively straightforward to create, to create a project. Okay? There's some settings in there that if you're going to do this, you might want to make sure you read those carefully. We're, one of the problems with doing a workshop is that we have a limited amount of time to try to, to get all these pieces in. And so we don't have the luxury of saying, let's take all day to create this project. In reality, you'd want to take your time, read the guides, make sure you're understanding what each thing does, ask questions about the things as you go through, and, and work your way through it. But what we've done, what we've done now is we've created, we've created these these two projects. One is a standard project and the other is a daughter project based on it. Okay? The other is a daughter project based on it where you're, you're going to work with that, that process. Now at this moment that daughter project doesn't have any text, right? right. It's blank. That You put some in. Well did you do the create based on or did you do import from? You did import from, okay, but the bottom one, the, the, the top one says import, import Matthew, but the bottom says create based on. Okay, that's okay. So reading things, reading things carefully makes a difference. Okay, now, if you, if you created the book, or you imported the book rather than creating it, what we can do Let's see, have I, I haven't finished creating it, so let me, let me, let me do mine here real quick, because I didn't do mine, ZZ, DB, or DP, um, for purpose of this, it's a daughter translation. I'm going to base mine on the ZZ99 because I didn't get around to creating the 17 yet. It's English. And the books of the New Testament. Now, here's what, what some of you did was instead of importing, instead of creating, you imported. So if I import Matthew, if I import Matthew, what I'm going to have is something that looks like this. And I say, oops, I didn't really want to import that text because those are exactly the same. They, now they're the same. They're exactly the same. What I want to do is delete that text. Okay, so here's how I do that. Project, manage books, project, manage books, delete books. And when I do this, it says, what books do you want to delete? And it says none. I'm going to choose Matthew. OK, delete one book, and now Matthew's gone. Now I can do what I was supposed to do. Well, now, actually, look up here for a second. Now, Paratex is giving me one more warning. It's saying that 
the book used to be part of the project and can be restored by clicking this link. So if at this moment I realize, oops, I accidentally deleted that and I didn't want to delete that, Paratext is giving me the ability to restore it right here. Okay? Or I can import it from somewhere else, or in the case of the assignment that we were doing, I could create it. And so if I click Create Books, when you create a book, Paratext gives you three options. Either you create an empty book, which means it's, it's totally empty. There's no markers. There's nothing there. It's just empty book. Or you create it with chapter and verse numbers, which means all it has is, you know, it would be Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5. No other markers. Or based on a project. And when you base it on a project, then it puts in all the other paragraph markers and section heads and everything else. So we want to create it based on the one that we were using as our base. And so what we end up with is a set of projects that just, just went into kind of a lock mode there. I love computers. I love computers. OK. So, it, so what you should have should look like this. Everybody got this? OK. Now, we've created the project. That was, that was the goal. We've created the projects. Have we done all the settings yet? No, not really. We didn't really do anything with the language. We haven't done anything with a custom style. We haven't done anything with custom versus. There's, there's a lot of things that we could still set. But we have created projects. Okay? We have created projects. I want to take just a second to talk about how this daughter translation functions, because it functions the same way a back translation would function. Okay? So the daughter translation, a back translation function the same way. And that is this. If I have text in verse 1 and say, the text, my text looks, here's my back translation or my daughter translation. This is the, this is what it looks like in the new, new translation. So there I've typed in verse 1. That could be a back translation of the text. That could be the daughter translation of the text. It's a, it's a text in another language. Okay, and then this is verse 2. Okay. So I've typed in my text. Notice that as I'm typing my text, what happens over on the other side? It highlights where I'm at so that I can see where I'm at. Okay. What are the boxes for? Good question, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you for leading into that. What are the boxes for? Okay, so the boxes are for me to be able to say this text that I've typed in, that I've done, this is Correct. If, it, if it's a daughter translation, we're saying that, yes, we've, this, is, this is a good translation of that text. It's acceptable. Or if it's a back translation, this is an acceptable back translation. So I'm going to click it and say, this is finished. Now, typically, I wouldn't want to check finished one by one by one. I'd use the button up at the top to say, everything in this chapter is finished but I can only mark finished the ones that I've actually put text in. Okay? So if I haven't put any text there, I can't say it's finished. Okay? I only have to have one If I have one text there, then I could say everything in that chapter is finished. And you'll notice that now has, you know, text mark. So Obviously, marking it finished is something I need to do carefully. Okay? And we're going to continue this discussion in 15 minutes after we take a break. Okay? So let's take a break for 15 minutes, and we'll come back and continue talking about what this means for me with the...